Hi, my name is Peggy, and my son Christopher was diagnosed at age four and a half with late infantile batten disease. Late infantile batten disease starts to show symptoms around age three, beginning with seizures, loss of motor skills, then loss of the ability to walk, talk, swallow, um, interact, and it is always fatal. Uh, because it's genetic, sometimes there are two and three children in the same family uh, that are all affected. And again, it's always fatal. No child has ever survived Batten disease. Uh, it is neurodegenerative, so there's an enzyme in everyone's body that allows the brain to rid the fatty deposits around the brain cells. Uh, children with Batten disease are missing that enzyme, so it's kind of like having garbage without a garbage truck. So it just deteriorates the brain cells as it progresses, and it progresses fast. Uh, Christopher passed away at age eight and a half from Batten disease. The vast majority of rare diseases have no FDA approved treatment. And so the treating physicians really have to use trial and error to try to find something that works for patients. Most people think this is because the markets are so small and no one is really motivated to develop drugs for rare diseases. But there are other problems and challenges that the stakeholders are working on. And one of the biggest ones is we really don't know what happens with people with rare diseases because, in fact, they're uncommon. And a physician might only see one or two in their entire career. And so we don't have a good idea of what's called the natural history. In other words, how do these diseases progress over time? FDA, along with multiple other organizations, is working to remedy this so that when developers are planning a treatment for rare disease, they'll be able to plan a clinical trial. They'll know what happens to people. They'll understand what outcome measures to measure or look for in the progression of the disease. And this will lay out a better path for developing treatment for any given rare disease and make it a lot more likely that an actual treatment will be found. So I encourage everyone to work together, get those natural history studies, those registries done, so we have even more success in treating rare diseases. In 2017, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research approved many new innovative therapies for patients with rare diseases, including the first treatment for Batten disease, a rare and fatal disorder of the nervous system. The new FDA-approved drug, Brunura, also known as Serlipinase Alpha, treats the slow loss of walking ability in children aged three and older who have a form of Batten's known as CLN2. FDA granted the Brunera application orphan drug designation, among other designations, which gives incentives for drug development for rare diseases. So how did this approval happen, and what are its implications? There are many complex issues when conducting clinical trials for rare diseases. The Brunera application is one of the first few applications that use the historical control, that is, comparing study data to natural history data for patients with the same disorder. This presented challenges. First, the study data and the data in the historical control had to be comparable. Second, we had to make sure that rating scales to measure the efficacy endpoint were comparable. We focused our evaluation of efficacy on working data because the two studies were not comparable in the measurement of another efficacy endpoint. Language use. At 96 weeks, there was a statistically significant difference in motor function favoring the Brunura treated group. We have learned a lot reviewing this submission, which will be helpful in guiding future rare disease drug development, including addressing complex clinical trial issues. Many rare diseases affect the central nervous system, causing neurocognitive and neurodevelopmental problems. One of the problems of delivering drugs in general, and large molecules in particular, is crossing the blood-brain barrier. To deliver a drug to the central nervous system, 
one must bypass that barrier. Now that's problematic because this barrier is designed to limit access to brain tissue. As a pediatrician, I know that some solutions to this problem aren't practical, especially for children, because they're so very active. So it's not just about developing the right treatment, but delivering it effectively. Brunura is administered into the cerebrospinal fluid by infusion via a specific surgically implanted reservoir and catheter in the head. This solution is a first step toward the goal of developing drugs that can be taken up into the central nervous system. Venera isn't right for all patients. The drug should not be administered to patients if there are signs of acute intraventricular access device-related complications, such as leakage, device failure, or device-related infection. Venera also should not be used in patients with shunts used to drain extra fluid around the brain. The most common adverse reactions in patients treated with Venera included fever, ECG abnormalities, hypersensitivity, decreased or increased protein in the fluid of the brain, vomiting, seizures, and hematoma.